So I uh, decided to come over from, from California um, and uh, share some, some thoughts on, on the circular economy or reuse and recycling, really. Um, so I've been, and now as a, as a bonus, uh, I have two of my mentors here in the audience, which is, which is fantastic. So there's Roland Clift right over there and Luke van Wassenhofer uh, right on the other side. So this is, uh, this is fantastic. Um, and as you can hear, I, I hail from Germany, from Europe and uh, lived in France, did my PhD in the UK and now have been in California for 12 years. So I'm trying to sort of keep connected to what's going on in, in Europe, uh, but also then trying to bring back uh, the California experience, because I think we're also doing some, some good things there. And uh, Reed, do tell me when my time is up. Um, <laughs> I need that. Um, so, um, Let's see, forward, is that how it works? Yes. So I think Reed described me really well um, when he said that I'm a big believer in the circular economy, in reuse and recycling, but also I've been around the block, no pun intended, for 15 years now. And, uh, and I'm very agnostic of the first, the fact that supply chains still are mostly linear. Um, so they're based on primary resource extraction and then finally waste disposal. Um, so, so there must be reasons why, why we don't already have a circular economy. And uh, a lot of sort of my time uh, is spent finding out what holds us up and what the constraints are and then finding ways to, to uh, successfully overcome those constraints. So, um, as uh, Jonathan already said, it, this circular economy is, is not a new idea. It's been obviously around for, I'd, I'd say, almost times immemorial. Uh, one of my PhD students was very excited. Apparently, he found a, a research paper where um, evidence of recycling was found in archaeological sites <laughs> dating back several thousand years. Um, but, and, and so, Rios and recycling has been around uh, uh, has been with us for a long time. Then in the 1980s, uh, people already pointed out the emergence of the industrial ecology perspective um, with the Frosch Galopoulos papers and, and the work by, by Ayers, uh, Bob Ayers, Tom Gradle. Um, in the 1990s, um, an additional perspective in particular also from, from the business school side, closed loop supply chains, um, and now we have a new name, circular economy, but the idea has stayed the same. And it's basically uh, turning the linear chains into loops. Um, and they're basically, there are three things we can do. We can recycle materials um, and then we can reuse components or we can try and reuse the entire product. And, uh, and there are uh, many different names for different things, refurbishment, remanufacturing, but they basically all fall into those, into those three bins, really. Um, and uh, so in economically successful supply, supply loops, uh, which I started off with studying how, how do we actually make them happen um, uh, um, from an economic point of view, they, they require three things. Uh, which also means that they cannot happen for three reasons, and there's only uh, and all three need to be uh, working. So the one, of course, is we need to be able to to collect. Uh, we need a, an, an efficient and a viable collection system, and uh, sometimes that's easier. Uh, then uh, in other times, and one of my case studies uh, way back when was uh, mobile phones. And one thing that turned out with mobile phones that uh, it was actually quite challenging to persuade the owners of the mobile phones to, um, to return them because they perceived there was some residual value and they didn't want to sort of keep them up. So there was this issue of people keeping them in their, in their bottom drawers. Um, the second, is we need a viable reprocessing technology. So even if we're able to uh, collect the, the end-of-life product or the end-of-use products or materials, we need pr uh, reprocessing technology that's viable. And viable means really two things. It means that it needs to be technologically feasible. Um, so 
I'd say one example, uh, think of Tetra Packs, so packaging that, that um, uses different materials. Uh, for the longest time, we didn't really know how to separate the materials at the end. Um, so that technology does exist now, but it is really expensive. So the other dimension of viable means it needs to be economically viable. So we need to have the technology and it also needs to be economically viable so that finally, if we generate the secondary resource, the recycled material, the reusable components, the, the refurbished, remanufactured products, that there's actually a market demand and the market demand the final thing is it needs you know it needs to be economically competitive with a primary virgin competitive it needs to be at appealing to the customer to the consumer and um and uh, that also means that it needs to be at, at, a, at a, a price point that people are, are willing to pay for um, and um, there, for example, um, again, just drawing on myself or mobile phone, cell phone in the US, mobile phone experience uh, was that the, the reprocessing, the remanufacturing of the cell phones really was um, a grand word for um, just testing whether the cell phone actually still works. So they, they didn't really do much repair of uh, mobile phones that, that didn't already power up and work because the companies told me that they just uh, um, cannot spend the money because then it would, it would no longer be a, a viable or profitable business. Um, so there are these three, what I will call sort of basic um, supply constraints of the circular economy and it's if and, and all three need to be resolved in, in order to have a successful supply loop um, environmentally successful supply loop so so we want success, uh, uh, um, the circular economy not just be economically viable but also environmentally uh, beneficial and and that means that really the the environmental benefits come from displacing virgin production and then also to avoid disposal but um, sort of environmental assessments of reuse and recycling consistently show that the big big environmental benefit is in avoiding primary production processes and not so much avoiding disposal processes so landfilling um, uh, commodity materials typically doesn't have um, a terrible environmental impact, so it's it's really avoiding the production of the primary steel, the primary aluminum, or or the the entire product. That's this is where the environmental benefit is. The other thing also is that if you actually don't displace primary production, you don't actually avoid disposal. If you think about it, you actually just delay disposal. Um, so, so you, you don't get uh, avoided landfill without avoided primary production. And one thing that so if we started being sort of sus suspect, started to suspect, but recently there's sort of more and more evidence as we do more research, is that there may be such a thing as what we now call circular economy rebound. And we obviously, we, we borrowed that notion from, from the energy rebound, which is well known that as you uh, have a, a more fuel efficient car, you save at the gas pump, petrol station, I should say. Um, and, and then you may decide to drive more. That's a well known uh, effect uh, uh, called energy rebound. So supply loops may actually for various reasons may actually lead to more use rather than displaced uh, primary production and and that would actually negate the environmental benefits of reuse and recycling obviously it's not black and white it's not either it you know completely displaces primary production or not at all the truth is going to be somewhere in the middle just like the rebound effect uh, the energy rebound effect but i think it's something that we really need to be aware of if we want uh, the circular economy not just being good for business but also good for the environment we need to make sure that we it successfully avoids uh, virgin or primary production um and then another thing that's sort of um, 
even though I have been looking at the issues for, as I said, 15 years, uh, uh, a thing that's sort of only recently I really sort of got my, my head around, um, is this idea of closed loops and open loops. So some people, some of you may not even aware of it, but in, in some areas uh, of industrial ecology, in particular environmental assessments, life cycle assessments, it's actually sort of a big issue. It's, is, it, is it reused and recycled in a closed loop or an open loop? And the, the definition typically key is that closed loop means in the same product system and open loop in a different product system. And sort of one of my issues I always had with that is what does the same actually mean? Obviously, it's not the exact same because we haven't invented time travel yet. So that's not really possible. So same means similar. So how similar does it actually need to be? And is this distinction really important for us? And I've come to the conclusion personally that actually it is not. Um, there are just, as I said, there are issues, problems with the distinction is that um, open loop does not automatically mean that we get more secondary material out of a unit of primary material. That's just not true. I had equations to prove it to you. Reed said no <laughs> equations. <laughs> are you crazy? Um, so no equations. But uh, um, it also doesn't automatically create higher environmental benefits. I, I did an LCA of for used oil recycling for uh, the California EPA. So the question there was uh, turning used oil back into lubricant surely must be better than um, just burning it as a fuel um, because it's a closed loop, so it must be better. And if you do the LCA, it's actually not clear at all if you do the life cycle segment. Uh, sorry for the acronym here. And as I already said, what does same product system even mean? So do we currently, I don't think we have a very uh, meaningful definition of closed loop. So I'm, I think we don't, we, we're better off. Um, someone wants me to stop talking here. Um, we're better off uh, just just thinking about displacement, which is sort of what I'm getting at. That was the wrong direction. I apologize for that. It's because there are two things that determine the environmental benefit um, of the reuse and recycling. It's the amount that we displace of primary production, and it's the difference between the impact of the re recycling and the reuse processes and the avoided processes, the avoided production. So that difference on a per unit basis gives you the unit and net environmental benefit of reuse and recycling and then we have to make sure that we actually how much we actually displace so it's it's basically the product of those two numbers so i did sneak in one equation so i apologize for that it's not a very complicated one um keep doing this um so finally um my insights after so 15 years of beating around the bush. What is going on here? There's a train station right behind there or something. Anyway, so uh, luckily I have a booming voice. Um, so I, after my, my two cents for the circular economy, if that's what we want to call it, um, it policy should not be guided too much by number of loops um, or whether we have a closed loop or whether we have an open loop. It's, in my opinion, it's, it's really the two guiding questions should be how much displacement is, is there, what do we displace and how much. And, um, and so therefore we should look for the activities with what I like to call the highest displacement potential, which is basically the product of how much we displace and the net benefit of displacement. And uh, I'll leave it at that.